Hello everybody. So I'm here to talk about a tool called BuildRoot that they have existed for quite a long time in the embedded world, but I think could be interesting for people that are working on containers and in data centers and that sort of stuff. So, what, for a start, I would like to give a little warning. I'm a person from the embedded world, and more precisely from the embedded industrial world. So that's totally different from mobile. Phones are, are totally different, and that's a bit different from consumer uh, embedded stuff. We don't exactly have the same problems. It's pretty similar, but still a bit different. And it's totally different from the data center. So again, I think I have a tool that might be interesting for other people, and that's why I wanted to talk about it, but I may be wrong. So if it does not solve your problems, that's fine. That's why, why we are here. The second thing is we're going to talk about root file system generation, and only root file system generation. There is nothing about namespace control groups or uh, that sort of stuff. I love that stuff. It's pretty cool, but it's not today's subject. So. Before we get started, a little word uh, on why I'm interested in containers and what they mean for the embedded world. So, uh, containers in the embedded world are uh, kind of a great technical tool that's still looking for a problem to solve. Uh, because we don't have anything like thin provisioning or dynamic deployment or uh, live migrations doesn't exist in the embedded world. Uh, our applications tend to be highly hardware dependent, so isolating from the hardware makes no sense. Uh, we do have some use cases for multiversioning and uh, different libraries or that sort of stuff, but it's mainly linked to old or closed source software that absolutely want that particular version of that particular library. It's usually more like a hack when we need it. There is also limited use cases for containers as a sort of uh, weak package manager, so I won't go deep into why, but in the embedded world in general, we try to avoid packages, like at any cost, because it breaks devices. So we usually reinstall from scratch when we upgrade, but it's a different uh, subject. And more and more there are people that try to push the DevOps approach into the embedded slash IoT world, but it's not that easy. It's not at, a, a, as easy because rapid deployment does not work. A typical upgrade of an uh, embedded device can take months or years because they stay offline, because people don't upgrade them, because various reasons, which means that whenever you do an upgrade, you have one more version of the software that's floating around and that you need to deal with and that will have a different upgrade path. So we try to limit the number of version, and upgrading one package in an image means a new version. So we tend to do big upgrades. Uh, we need to archive all source code for legal reasons. I mean, if you're in the data center, you're providing a web service, usually, and you don't need to redistribute your code. You should do it, but you're not legally forced to do it. In the embedded uh, world, we are which means that whenever we do an upgrade, it's one more version we need to archive and distribute. So that's a lot of work. And the last point, rollbacks are really frightening. I mean, we do have rollbacks mechanism, and they're very robust because they're not allowed to fail. But you need to remember that we have no access to our devices once they are sold. We might have remote access depending on the use case and what's actually implemented, but that's very limited. And if things go wrong, we're toast. So we tend to be very, very cautious. So the last point that stays is containers as a security feature, which again is not that simple. Why? Mainly because it's hard to um, split an embedded system into components. There is usually one user space software that does the grunt of the job, and it needs network access because it's basically getting stuff from the network, all hardware access because it's driving the hardware, and all data access because the data is what we need to drive the hardware. So splitting in in front-end, back-end, database and stuff like that doesn't really work for the embedded world. But still, we are trying to look into it, trying to see how to use it, and seeing what's going on. So 
what do we want? Because of those, well, legal requirements and also because we need to manage software in the very long term, like 20 years, we need complete traceability to the line of code. Everything needs to be checksummed and we need to make absolutely sure that every line of code that ends up in our product is archived. Okay, so complete archival of the source code, all source tarballs, all patches, when we ha have a, to add a patch to upstream, we need to keep that patch, all overlays, because we add files just like everybody to our images, we need to archive, and all scripts that we run during debugging need to also be archived. And we also need to be very independent from our host. Why is that? Because in 20 years, Ubuntu 26 will not work with packages we've been building now. So we need to archive also all our tools, compilers, so the source of the compiler, the compiler, the auto tools, the source of auto tools, all that sort of stuff. So, build root. So, build root is an image building system. It's basically an automated Linux from scratch. It has big make files that will handle dependencies for you. So if you ask it to be, build Apache, it will find the dependencies and it will build the, all the dependencies for you. Then it will download everything. All checksum is verified by BuildRoot directly. If you provide patches, it will patch your software. Run, configure, build step, install. It's also an image generation tool. So once we have installed, we'll have to transform this into something that is usable. So that's tweaking permission and adding a SU ID or a root uh, permissions on the different files, adding customized files and content, creating file system images, pack it, packing file system in images into disk images, because we also do host system, it's not just containers, collecting all the licenses and making sure they haven't changed, and collecting all the source code for archival. That's all the things it does. It's cross-compilation friendly because, well, most embedded ARM devices are way too small to compile their own software, so we need to cross-compile. And it's a very old project, since 2001. The overall philosophy we have in the embedded world is one command to do everything. We type make, build root is make base, so you type make, and at the end you have an image, and everything is automated. So, quick example, how does it work? You clone build root. You use menu config to customize your build. Here I just changed the architecture to x86-64, mainly as an example. You type make, you have an image. At this point, you start needing to be root because we're going to uh, unpack the, our root file system and just launch it with nspawn. I use nspawn because it's the one I know, but there is nothing nspawn specific in build root. So what we have in this image, it's already a working image. It has a busy box, so basic shell and utilities. Micro libc, no kernel. We did not enable kernel building. It did not only build micro libc and busy box. It did the whole tool chain generation, auto tools, which are ne needed for busy box, make dev, fake root, and a few other tools that are needed to build the image. It's technically a heavy container because it has an init system. It's a system 5 type init system that comes with BizBox, but it's in there. It took me on this laptop uh, 12 minutes to build with uh, everything pre-downloaded, and it's 1.6 megabytes total, so it's very small. As a comparison, I also used a pre-compiled uh, GNU C library toolchain, and in that, uh, in that same case it, took, it takes only one minute to compile, but it's 6.3 megabytes large. So uh, the GNU C library is quite larger. Is it a lot? It depends on your use case, but it's like three times as large. So it's, it's an important difference. Something a little bit more realistic, we're going to do a light container with Apache. So light container means no init system, and we'll try to remove everything we can remove. So what did I do? I, did, I changed a, little, a few more options. Uh, I was tired of recompiling my two chains, so I took a pre-compiled uh, two chain from, uh, from Butlin, which prov uh, provides us with a sort of service. I've added Apache, and I've removed anything I could remove. So I removed BusyBox entirely which means that we have no shell, no standard utility, no nothing. 
I told uh, Beldrud that this new system would have no init system, so it removed any init.d or uh, our systemd services that might be lying around. And I also told him that there was no symlink for slash bin slash sh, because there is no shell. We do the same thing, and we rebuild, and we have a functional light container. So, no shell, no init system, no customization whatsoever. You will have the Apache It Works page, and that's it. Uh, it took me three minutes to build, and it's 11 meg size. So, Apache is a bit big, but it's still reasonable. And then you need to learn to use it, because it's not that obvious. Uh, Apache control, which is a standard way to start an Apache server, doesn't work, because it's a shell script, and we have no shell. So you have to launch it manually. So again, I use nspawn, which is the one I know. And so you just give it SPID2, and you tell HTTPD to run in the foreground, because by default, it will fork. And when it forks, the main process dies. And when the main process dies in a container, the containers terminate. So you need to keep it around. So yeah, very easy to use. That's the whole point. Very small and very easy. So now, how would you customize? Because right now, we just took a generic Apache, and we have nothing for us. The mm, easiest way and the most common way to do it is with overlay. So I'm Yes, most of you are familiar with overlays. I mean, that's more or less how you do it with Docker files too, so I guess it should be okay. Basically, you tell a um, build root, you give it a directory, and you tell it this is stuff that you have to put on top of your file system, and it will just put it on top of the file system after everything else. So you tell it where it is, so top dir slash overlay. You create the directory and the subdirectories as you want them in your target and you simply put the file in there. Still, I'm a normal user. I do nothing as root. You run your make, you unpack your file system, and you uh, run it. So in this example, I did a portable service. So I don't know most of you, you're familiar with portable service? Okay, so portable service allows you to package in an image a binary, its dependencies, and run it as a systemd service. And it's basically a light container plus a service file, so it can be used out of the container itself. Weird way to define it, but it'll do. So the only thing I add is the apache.service file, and then I run it. So again, I don't care about uh, container configuration, so I just used the trusted profile from systemd and did not go into the details of configuration. And it works. That's it. So. Uh, the, the whole point is that using overly directories is, is great for archival because it's trivial to use with Git. Because you see when your files ch are changed, you can trivially archive them, you can trivially work with them, and overall it's, it's always the same thing. I mean, the whole point with, um, with build root is that anybody who wants to play with it, you just clone the stuff, make when you can fit, build, and it works. It's just play with it, and you'll see how e easy it is to use. So there we go. Other oh, customization tools. We have a patch directory. So there is a directory. You, can, you create a subdirectory for any package you want, and you put a patch in there, and build root will automatically apply that patch to the sources. So you have this chain where build root will download the source, check the checksum for you, apply any patch you give, you, you give it, and build the whole thing. And the whole thing is checked, and the patches are, again, in directories that are is easy to store in Git. So it's pretty easy to have everything you put in your image stored in a single place and trivial to find. Post rootfs scripts are uh, scripts which are run within fake root. Do people here know a little bit how fake root works? Yes. So fake root. Okay, I'll do a quick reminder. Uh, fake root basically uh, allows you to run um, any uh, process, and it uses LD preload to go under, well, between the C library and the process, and it will emulate any call that would require root permissions. 
So for instance, if you try to change the UID, the, um, the ownership of the file to root, it will write down somewhere that you tried to do that and tell you that it worked. And whenever you ask him, him about the permission again later, it will give you its root. But it won't do the actual change. It just simulates them for you. But it's good enough to build an image as a normal user. Because you create your image like that, so pretending to be a root, and still be in this same fake root universe, you will run tar, and you will create the tar files with fake permissions. But inside the tar files, you will actually have the right UID. So that's how you can create a whole tar file containing uh, block devices or containing files owned by root without being root yourself. Linux won't, uh, won't allow you to untar the file because you will need the right permissions to untar, but you can create the tar file. And in the same way, after that, you can, within fake root, you can then take the tar file and create a disk image containing uh, root-owned files without being root. So the whole thing, uh, so this post root FS script allows you to run uh, shell scripts within fake root to do the kind of adjustments where you actually need to, do, to be root to do them. And then you have less used case, which is a post image script, which is more for the stage where you assemble various partitions and file system images into a disk image. So that's less useful for containers, I guess. But when we're doing actual embedded stuff, we use that a lot. So yeah. This whole thing has been around for a long time and has solved the problem of archival and of reliability, which is the whole point. So, why use build root? What does it bring? So, we're source based. You have all the source of everything around. Signatures are included in the recipe. I mean, uh, build root upstream, whenever it uh, upgrades the version of a package available in build root, it will include in the build root uh, git the hash of the source. So when you build, your system will go and download, say, on GitHub, a Git repository, and then will compare that with the hash comings from the build root project. So everything is checked automatically. No need to be root to build images. So uh, this morning, I've learned about the, all the different versions of a rootless container building. This one is also completely rootless. It does not have any SUID binaries anywhere. We just do everything as a normal user. You don't need any root-only call to build an image. Complete archival, complete traceability, complete license compliance. These are really, really needed in the embedded world. So we kind of can't work without them. Uh, highly independent from the host system, so it's kind of obvious when you think, think uh, cross-compilation, but we do need to rebuild every tool. We need to rebuild uh, the auto tools, we need to rebuild make, because different versions of make produce different builds, so if you want your build to be reproducible, you have to have the same version of make. And more import importantly, in 30 years' time, who knows what version of make we will have, and if you have to rebuild an old software in 30 years, it's very important to save all the source code. I mean, if you want a good source of stories where open source saves the day, go and find some, um, some very early Linux users because those are the ones that had serious problems with hardware and that could solve it because they could patch kernel, kernels that were 20 year old. And it works, and it's awesome, and you can save your customers' lives this way. I did it a couple of times. So, um, all patches are visible and easy to manage, same idea. We have all the source code around. Reduced attack surface, if you have uh, binary-based uh, distributions, you cannot easily or not at all change compilation options. With this system, if, you, if it doesn't find uh, an optional def dependency for a software, it will compile the software without the support for that optional dependency. So, reduced attack surface. Uh, reproducible builds, they are marked as experimental, but uh, in practice they work really well. I mean, uh, BuildRoot and Yocto, the embedded world in general, we have been pushing for reproducible build for a long time, and we're really glad that people like Red Hat and Debian have started pushing too, because it, because it helps a lot. Um, so, very easy to build portable services and like containers because, again, you can have everything from scratch and you have all the dependencies managed. You don't even need to know what your dependencies are, so you'll just build it. 
it's easy to debug and hard to debug. It's easy to debug because you have everything available. You have all the source, all the debug symbols. It will keep all the build directory, so all the build artifacts everywhere. So in a way, it's easy to debug. Uh, it's hard to debug because you don't have a shell. Well, usually you have a shell, but if you start removing every tool in your image, you won't have any debugging tool. And sometimes it's very disturbing to discover that nothing works. So you have to know about remote debugging, or you have to tweak your image to have a shell to debug, or there's all sorts of stuff which makes it a bit tricky. Uh, you need to understand Linux. That's, um, hard, um, that's pretty surprising, but there's all sorts of stuff in Linux nobody knows about. So the very frightening PAM, for example, or TTY management, or all those sorts of subjects. Your distro does a great job of handling that for you. Except that when you're really working with empty containers, like very minimal, you won't have that. So you will have to tweak some areas where nobody is very con comfortable. So know about it. And build time, yes and no. Build time nowadays on modern machines are very short, especially when you have already everything downloaded. Of course, you don't download multiple time. It just downloads the first time. So. Um, Build time is, uh, might be an issue, it's for you to measure. That's the big idea with build root. It's easy and it traces everything and you have all the source code available. Thank you. <laughs> so, any questions? Um, I've been working also in the embedded work, mm -hmm. uh, more specifically with medical devices. Yes. Um, so the development flow was a bit different because you wouldn't want to flash the device each time you did a change with the code. So you will just have a NFS mount of the file system, usually locally, and then you will maybe use AirSync uh, with a staging folder where you will just install your mm -hmm. artifacts to, to mount it there. Um, how is your development flow by using build root? Do you need to flash each Does time or? Build root is just about making the files that will go on the target. So you can, uh, in this example, I've um, only generated tarballs, but you can uh, generate file system images. When I use it with a remote uh, root on NFS, like you do, I usually have some, uh, well, this time they need to be uh, SUID scripts that will just untar the tarball in whatever directory is mounted remotely. You reboot the device and you're good. It's, it's a process to learn how to make it. Build root doesn't care about that. It's, the stay, it's really the step before. And back then, we weren't really able to use fake root for mm -hmm. generating the tarballs. We used sudo tar at the very end uh, because we had some binaries with capabilities set like a capnet row or so on? I think the newest version of fake root handle capabilities, okay. but just retest, don't take my word for it. Okay, thanks. Follow-up question on that. Um, so Yocto, I think, uses or gives you the ability to wrap the resulting artifacts in devs and RPMs, so you have an mm -hmm. option to service the image that is other than flashing, whether it's actually flashing or what you're describing. Um, with you know individual kind of package upgrade operations, any plans to do that in build root? No, uh, that's pretty much the opposite of the build root philosophy. So build root is a uh, Linux as a firmware. Yocto builds you a complete distribution, which includes images to install your distribution. But it's a distribution be before being an image generation system. So they're really the opposite philosophically. And so, no, it would be against what uh, build root is trying to do. If you want packages, you should go with Yocto. It's the right tool for the job. Now, I can explain uh, build root in 20 minutes with a couple of slides. I cannot do it with Yocto. Uh. Nowadays, these uh, containers and other things are available in multiple platforms, like you can run container on ARM or other things. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think currently, if you want to build an ARM container, it will be of the, it, the from image or whatever will be again an ARM image. So, so in a OCA, normal, if you have Docker you take, you can run a Docker in uh, your Raspberry Pi or any mm -hmm. other 
ARM platform or any other platform also. Mm -hmm. So to build that, you have to be in the ARM. Uh, oh, you mean you, when you're doing Docker for ARM, you usually build on ARM? Yeah, otherwise you have to have a, some kind of a, that's what my understanding is. I never build it. Well, Just yeah. A, Mm. So my question is here, can build root can easify this sitting using its cross compiler and build to an another target for OCI compliance mm. targets? Well, there are multiple answers. So the question basically is why cross compile when you can directly compile on ARM systems? No, that, that's the problem is it will be low hardware, so it will take more time. That's one of the reasons, especially, well, you, you have server arms and you have embedded arms. Yeah. And the embedded arms nowadays could compile that sort of stuff, but it will take hours. It will be incredibly yeah, long. Yeah, that's what. So what, what, what I'm asking, uh, asking is, uh, by sitting in x86 architecture, mm -hmm. I, can I use build root and build an a... Uh, yes. Yeah, so is build root support some kind of packaging for... Uh, OCA compliant and uh, images? It does not uh, handle uh, OCI uh, images, so it would be rather easy to add. It's just that nobody did it, as far as I know. Um, yeah, basically. Uh, I think you can just take the tarball and put it in the container and you're done. Probably. Uh, again, I, I, I don't, OCI and, and containers, I don't know well. So if you can answer it, uh, it's a good question for me, I'm glad. I, I think that's uh, people who are doing this on Jocto, that's how they do it, Okay. Uh, I think. But not only like, uh, you get uh, a lot of unwanted things, which is, which is not required for a container. A lot of file system building and so many other things. Okay. Yeah, but then, then you need to do the light container like he just described, and then you just get the stuff you need, and then you unpack that using Docker or whatever you use. And that's yeah, fine. you can probably repackage the root file system into Docker. I, I don't know enough of Docker to do it. I do it with nspawn because that's the one I know, but it's the only one I know. <laughs> Just a question because of uh, um, <clears throat> light sensing and uh, version traceability. Do you check in your whole, like for example, build root repository with all the settings you done into Git and that's it? Or how do you archive? So how there are various uh, philosophy depending on who you're asking. How we do it, we have a Git repository where we have build root as a sub-module. Okay, so we clone build root and we only we work upstream for packages that are in build root and for everything that is specific and we think cannot be upstream, we keep it in a separate Git repository using some modules and some make file tricks basically. So that means that our sub modules we have over all the overlays, all the scripts that are specific to our build, and in the build root we have everything uh, upstream and that need to be upstreamed, which is directly there. Everything is the uh, checksum by the Git commit of the under one, which uh, also includes the git commit of build root, which includes all the files in build root, which are all the recipes, and each recipe contains a checksum for the source it downloads. So you have a recursive checking of all the signatures. I have not checked the complete security model, but uh, there is no trivial way to go and inject. You would have to inject it in the project, then you would have to trick all the automated build systems the project uses to check which are spread around the world, I don't know where they are, to miss whatever checksum you've put in there and, and everything recursively. So it seems kind of solid to me, but I'm not a security expert, uh, so I can't say much more on that. Uh, last question. I'm not sure if that's the right question, but can you also use uh, statically linked uh, binaries to reduce the size of the image? So rather than the, the light container? Yes. Uh, build root has uh, somewhere in the compilation options something to have uh, aesthetically linked libraries. KVAT, uh, most software are not tested with statically linked libraries, so sometimes they break. All right, but build root knows how to do it. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy. Thanks.